So, uh, in this video lecture, I want to talk through um, this fairly small amount of theorization we get on why the Gothic is so successful and so popular as a genre. Um, so this is by Anne Letitia Aiken, who uh, later becomes uh, Anna Barbel, uh, and John Aiken. Um, and they sort of wrote this essay together and then composed this fragment, uh, Sir Bertrand a fragment, uh, as an example of the Gothic. So uh, I ask you guys to read this, this essay that they wrote on pleasure derived from objects of terror with Sir Bertrand a fragment. Um, and essentially, uh, at the bottom of, so, I mean, on 590, at the bottom of the paragraph that starts on the previous page, we get their central question, which is, uh, the apparent delight with which we dwell upon objects of pure terror, where our moral feelings are not in the least concerned, and no passion seems to be excited, but the depressing one of fear is a paradox of the heart. So, essentially... They accept that uh, the excitation of emotion can be pleasurable when it serves some sort of moral purpose. What they are investigating or what they are interested in is why we like to be scared when it serves no practical purpose. Um, and so, I mean, they identify... Uh, they identify a, a sort of genealogy of horror uh, with Greek, Roman, and later on sort of Renaissance tragedy and things like this, Gothic romances and sort of tales of Eastern mysticism and things like this. And they give an initial, uh, an initial idea here, uh, which goes from the bottom of 590 to 591, uh, the pain of suspense and the irresistible desire of satisfying curiosity when once raised will account for our eagerness to go quite through an adventure that we suffer actual pain during the whole course of it. So this is the initial theory that um, once we are interested in something, once we are uh, intrigued by it, we will, uh, we will continue to pursue that sort of resolution, even if it's unpleasant in its own experience. Um, but they say this isn't this isn't sufficient because if that's all it is, we would not consciously pick up a book we knew was going to be terrifying. We would not consciously choose to read the Gothic because we know that it will be scary, and that's sort of the point of it. Um, and so they say this is an insufficient explanation. And so they come up with a new thesis. Um, and this is about midway down the page on 591. A strange and unexpected event awakens the mind and keeps it on the stretch. So this conclusion that they come to in this, in this quite brief essay is that the supernatural, the unexpected, uh, the unrealistic, the improbable, all of these things that the Gothic really relies on um, work to keep the mind alert. And, that's, and that in itself is a pleasant experience. Like, it creates a space of imagination. Um, so as they say here, where the agency of invisible beings is introduced, of forms unseen and mightier far than we, our imagination, darting forth, explores with rapture the new world which is laid open to its view and rejoices in the expansion of its powers. Passion and fancy cooperating elevate the soul to its highest pitch, and the pain of terror is lost in amazement. So, essentially what they're arguing here is um, the same kind of, kind of argument that advocates of science fiction and fantasy uh, novels and movies m might make today, that the opening up of new worlds and of new possibilities, incidentally I'm teaching a science fiction and fantasy course in the fall, and I need people to sign up for it, so if you need an English class for the fall, uh, think about that, uh, English five, uh, 257. But 
the, their idea is that the opening up of new worlds and the expansion of possibilities that this implies um, is is delightful, is this sort of source of delight as we sort of experience the world as a space of possibilities rather than um, more didactic novels that had that had been sort of traditional fare uh, in the early and and mid 18th century. Um, so rather than having novels that sort of just said, this is how the world is, I will represent it directly, this is a space of possibilities and of freedom. Uh, and that to them uh, is why uh, horror, why the gothic, why terror is such an exciting thing and why people frequently seek it out. Um, and they offer us Sir Bertrand a fragment as a, as a sort of means of proving this. And uh, this is, I mean, Sir Bertrand is almost heavy-handed in its sort of use of the Gothic. Like if this was, if this was written today rather than in the sort of early days of the Gothic, uh, this would probably be fairly cliché. Um, I mean, we've got, because we've got a lot of stuff here that's characteristic of the Gothic. Um, we've got a knight uh, who, after being lost on this sort of desolate moor, encounters this antique mansion, uh, crumbling towers, crumbling archways, and so on and so on. Like, this is the Gothic setting par excellence. Uh, there are creepy noises, the doors are creaking, and, and stuff like this. Um, the door slams behind him after he enters the castle, and so on and so on. Um, all this just creepy stuff happens. Um, a dead, cold hand grabs him and sort of drags him up the stairs until he cuts it off. Um, and all this stuff. Uh, and then we've got this coffin, like he shows up in this room after going up these sort of dark, twisting passageways. Um, and there's this coffin... Uh, and this woman, this woman in a veil, sort of sits up out of the coffin, and he goes to her, and, and she kisses him. And so again, we've got this gothic eroticism in the midst of this really sort of terrifying uh, setting. Um, but then it's weird. Like, the ending is weird because all of a sudden everything is awesome. Like, it's bright, and he's on a nice sofa, and there's some dancing girls and whatever, and... This beautiful woman is like, thanks for saving me. But even in that, even in this feast scene, there's something, I mean, this remains a sinister scene. Like, you don't want the fragment to end there. Like, it's, that in itself is maybe sort of more nerve-wracking than anything else, is that, that the fragment just ends, and you're like, no! That that's not that's not the ending point. Like it has there has to be more to it. Like what happens with this? Because there's this sort of sense of uh, there's this sense of suspense even in the the resolution. And so I, I mean I I think the the Akins are not wrong in their initial sort of supposition that once it's established, uh, we're driven by a need to sort of satisfy our curiosity. But, I mean, they're also, they're also quite correct that this opens up a series of possibilities. I mean, and actually the fact that we have this very frustrating non-ending where the fragment just stops uh, is actually a really, really good technique for opening up possible worlds because we're left to imagine, well, is this a sinister trick? Is this a genuine sort of feast and stuff? Uh, what is the explanation of, of this thing that happens to Sir Bertrand? Um, and this is a technique that later horror writers use. I mean, you take something, for instance, like, um, um, like the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. The horrific things that he does, um, or you take... Um, the Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, which some of you will read in the Victorian period, like, the crimes of Mr. Hyde are not described in detail, by and large. 
It just said that horrible things were done, and this becomes a technique of allowing the emotion to sort of range, and for people, for readers to to imagine horrific things, uh, which is more terrifying, really, than than having stuff narrated and having it sort of nailed down to one to one thing. So this is. Uh, this is one of the theories of the Gothic that's going on at this time. Again, because this is such a such a popular genre, so many people are producing novels, and so many people are reading the novels and poetry and things like this. Um, there are other theories of the Gothic, but this is one important one. 